If it isn't one thing, it's another. The trials and tribulations of our lives just never seem to stop. You finally get over the anguish of wanting a companion in your life, having been single for so many years. You find someone, finally, you get married. And then a new kind of suffering comes into your life. You have all these little fights. You have all these, some of these big fights with your spouse. A new stage brings new suffering. You work on your marriage for a while, then you think, oh, that's it. It's time to have kids. And you find God isn't giving you children. You're having a hard time conceiving. God gives you kids. Finally, you get pregnant, but it's a, a problematic pregnancy. And then the baby comes, and you go many months without a good night's rest. Baby grows up, they learn to sleep, and then they start moving around. They, they destroy the house. You've got so many problems in your life. We all do. Every new stage of life brings new problems, new kinds of suffering into our lives. And on top of all these things who are connected to our life stage, we have all of these things that are always with us. We have things around the house that need to get fixed, that are broken. We have sickness that comes our way, or loved ones who get sick, people who die in our lives that we care about. We've got problems at work. We've got financial problems, church problems. To quote my dad, life is hard then you die. And that is why um, Christ's words in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, feel like a balm for our tired souls. I just preached this last month. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And we hear those words and we think, now that is what I need right now. And many of us, hearing those words, have come to seek refuge in Christ. But what happens next to us after we do that? usually takes us by surprise. We find that our life is still full of pain and suffering, even though we are convinced that God dearly loves us. You see, God doesn't just take all our suffering away. Not when we become a Christian, not at any time until we die. Indeed, in his word, God actually tells us that from the Christian life, we should expect to suffer even more. This new stage of our life as a Christian, as good as it is, as many blessings as it has, also introduces into our lives new kinds of suffering. Jesus says if we want to follow him, we must be willing to deny ourselves and to pick up our own cross of suffering. So what we see in the Bible is that the way to the kingdom is not a way that takes us as a detour around the sufferings of life. But the way to the kingdom is a journey right through the eye of the storm. Today, we're going to consider what it looks like to follow Christ on the way that is marked with suffering. So if you are suffering today, you have been suffering. This is a message for you. As we examine God's word together, we're going to extract nine lessons on how to carry our crosses and to help our brothers and sisters in Christ to carry their own cross. I ask that you pray with me now and to ask God to help us this morning to speak to us through his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come as a people who have been suffering, who have been going through so much, who know the trials and tribulations and troubles of life very well. And we pray that your words would be a balm to our souls this morning that they would be a light in our darkness and show us the way forward. And above all, we pray that that light would show us Christ in a new and more wonderful way today, that we might fix our eyes on him again. And we pray this to the praise of his glory and in his name. Amen. 
Well, today uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 14, and um, I'm going to start by looking down at verse 22 here, near the end of the chapter, and near the end of verse 22. Because at this point, you get the headline for what the whole passage is really telling us. Paul says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. We're going to go through tribulations, Paul says. Hard times are going to come. This is how it must be, he says. This is how it has to be, because this is the course that God has set out for us. Many tribulations, in the sense of various kinds of tribulations, of different intensities that coming at different times are going to come into our lives. And we must respond to these tribulations in our life, just like Jesus Christ responded to the tribulations in his life. Because as always, Christ is our example as his people. And Christ's example is clearly reflected here in Acts chapter 14 through the example of Paul. Paul here suffers many tribulations. And then he responds to these tribulations in a godly and Christ-like way that we need to imitate. So we're going to be looking at his example today to show us how to suffer like Christ. And we're going to identify nine lessons we can apply in our own life as tribulations come our own way. So let's get started. And uh, we're going to get started here at the beginning of the passage where Paul is now in the city of Iconium. Let's take a look. Verses 1 to 7. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of, of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made, by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. As I noted last week, Paul is right now on his first major missionary journey. He and his companion Barnabas are going around the Mediterranean preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So people might hear this good news and find salvation by putting their faith in Jesus. We come to see, though, as we read these descriptions of his journey, that it was not just some kind of victory lap that he was taking. This was hard work being on this journey. It required strength and stamina and sacrifice. Not just because he was traveling long distances, which in the ancient world, that would have been a challenging journey for sure. But on those long distance journeys, he was serving Christ. He was being faithful to Christ's call. And in this way, Paul was welcoming additional kinds of suffering into his life that were in some ways far more severe than the challenge of travel in those days. Last week, we watched as the persecution in the city of Pisidian Antioch got so bad that the leaders of the city uh, went after him and drove him out of the city. And so he, he just finishes suffering in Pisidian Antioch, and now he goes over and he makes his way to the next city, Iconium. And there, we will see that he will suffer even more for Christ. Luke says, as Paul preaches the gospel in the city, the city starts to divide. Some people believe Paul's words. They become followers of Christ who support Paul in his mission. Others oppose Paul. And that group starts to poison people's minds with lies about Paul and about these Christians. So accusations are swirling in the city of Iconium. Paul is already starting to suffer for Christ as his good name is being slandered with all of these people spreading these lies about him. And how does he respond? 
He stays there and he takes it as he continues to do the very thing that is leading them to oppose him. That brings us to lesson number one. When tribulations approach, sometimes God will call you to stay and face them. Paul doesn't run away when people start assaulting his character, when people start spreading lies about him. He doesn't wallow in self-pity about how mean people are being or how unfair this is. You know, Paul continues to do the very thing that is turning people against him. He continues to tell people about Jesus. Because he knows this is the very thing that Christ has called him to do in this situation. So when people start calling him names because he's talking about Jesus, he just keeps doing it. This is bringing suffering into his life in an ongoing way. But Paul's goal is not to avoid suffering in life. His goal is to imitate Jesus and to fulfill his commission that he's received from Jesus to make disciples by telling people about him. When suffering and the tribulations of life come our way, sometimes God, God calls us to stay and to face them. Which shows us that obedience sometimes takes courage. And Paul models this courage here. He doesn't back down when he is being slandered. He stays in Iconium for a long time, Luke says. He doesn't back down. He stays. He serves Christ because this is where Christ wants him to serve. In time, though, the situation in the city changes. And so then does Christ's will for Paul's life. Eventually, the opposition grows to the point where people start saying, you know what, these insults aren't working. They're not stopping Paul. Let's move on to the rocks. And they try and corner Paul to stone him. And once this happens, Paul's response changes. Verse 6, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe. Luke in no way pictures this as an act of cowardice on Paul's part. Evidently, this is what the Spirit had told Paul he should do. The Spirit told them to get out of the city while they still can, to flee. And that brings us to lesson number two. When tribulations approach, sometimes God will call you to flee. But look closely at what they are actually fleeing here and what they are not fleeing. Yes, they flee the city of Iconium, but they do not flee their calling. Luke points out in verse 7 that they continued to share the gospel once they got to the next city. It's an important distinction to make. If God calls you to stop serving in some particular place or in some particular way, he is not calling you to just retire and stop serving altogether. We must always serve God no matter where we are in life. And we must ultimately let God decide where and how we serve. And then listen if God calls us to go. Sometimes God will call you to stay and suffer tribulation so you can be a light in the darkness. Sometimes God will call you to go and to flee so you can serve somewhere else. But whatever it is that God calls you to do, you must obey. For your calling and my calling is not fundamentally to protect ourselves or to avoid suffering in life. Our calling is fundamentally a calling to Christ. So when Christ calls, we must answer. Whether he calls and tells us to go or tells us to stay. The next city that Paul and Barnabas go to is the city of Lystra. And you can see it on the map here in the next side. If Goy can bring that up for us. Here we go. So he was right there at the top. That is Antioch and Pisidia. If you can see that. He moves southeast down on that red route to Iconium, then moves a little bit south down to Lystra. That's where he is now. Uh, the reception he gets in Lystra couldn't be more different than the reception he got in Iconium. 
Let's take a look at the next verses here, verses 8 to 13. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speak. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconium, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. In a Jesus-like way, Paul is able to perceive that this crippled man has faith that he can be healed. And by the power of Christ, Paul is able to heal him. But something really interesting happens as a result. When the crowds see what Paul has done to this man, they don't just admire Paul, they worship Paul. They conclude that Paul and Barnabas are actually Hermes and Zeus in human flesh. Even the local priest agrees with them and leads this oxen out with a garland around its neck to try to sacrifice this oxen to the gods in their midst. Now, if you think about it, this too is a kind of tribulation that Paul faces. It's a tribulation in the form of a strong temptation. You can put yourself in Paul's shoes. These people are willing to do anything for you. They're convinced that you are a god. You have almost unlimited influence over them. Everybody is singing your praises. Why not just sit and enjoy it for a little while? Why not ask some people to do some things for you? Would it really be that bad? But Paul knows that this is dangerous. It's not physically dangerous this time, it's spiritually dangerous. He's being tempted to disobey God by siphoning off praise that belongs to God. He's got this opportunity to use power and influence however he wants. And as the saying goes, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts, absolute. And from this angle, we can see how even God's blessings can sometimes bring tribulation into our life when God blesses us with a great abundance of something. There's a danger in being extremely powerful or very rich or very beautiful or very widely admired and loved. These blessings can become a spiritual danger to us because we all have this impulse within us to do what is evil, to serve ourselves rather than to serve God and others. That's why uh, the famous Christian writer John Piper refuses to receive money for the books that he publishes. He says it's because it would be too spiritually dangerous for him to get rich. The way of Christ is not to get more of the world by any means necessary. The way of Christ is to serve God as we trust God to provide us with what we need. That was Jesus' approach when he was attempted with more of the world. Satan came and offered Jesus all the power and glory the world has to offer, all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus refused because he knew that this was the very opposite of what God had called him to do. And here Paul imitates Christ's example by refusing to accept more of the world when it was offered to him in a way that would compromise his faith. At verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of nature, of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed, the he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, 
they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. So Paul and Barnabas, they make a scene in this crowd by ripping their clothes. It was a way in those days of communicating that somebody has just spoken blasphemy. And this kind of crazy action gets people's attention and they give Paul a chance to address the situation. He says to them, everybody, stop it. Don't worship us. We are just men. We have good news to share. The living God has created this world. He has created us all. For many generations, this God has been merciful with the peoples of the world. When they acted in ways that deserved death, in sinful ways, God did not immediately destroy those nations. In fact, he was gracious to them. God decided to keep sending rains to their lands, to keep feeding them, to sustain them, even to satisfy them. This is how Paul begins his address here. It shows that he refuses to turn against God and God's will. Instead, Paul insists on turning others toward God. And this brings us to lesson number three. When tribulations approach, God calls us to keep the focus on him. Paul never loses sight of God in this time of tribulation. He doesn't start thinking about how great it, would, it feels to have this power. He's focused on glorifying and obeying God. So he immediately recognizes that, that, that this is not of God, and he rejects this worship that he's receiving. So think about it. Even when others want to put Paul at the center, Paul insists that he must not be at the center because God must be at the center. It's remarkable. It's profoundly God-centered. Talk about resisting temptation. Think about how much we want to live in a world where everything is about us. That's the world that we think of in our mind. It's this self-centered world where we think everybody's always thinking about us and what matters is what's going to happen to us. Paul not only has that in himself, that evil impulse, but he has a whole crowd of people who are saying, you are at the center. You're the most important. We'll give you anything. And he says, that's not right. God must be at the center. An example to us of how to respond in the face of temptation. But before long, here again, as they did in Iconium, the winds shift and the response of the crowd changes. This time, it's because leading Jews from the cities that Paul and Barnabas had already left finally catch up to him in Lystra. And once they get to Lystra and they see Paul and Barnabas there, they turn the city against Paul and Barnabas. Look at verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. These leaders are so extremely committed to destroying Paul, to stopping this gospel he's preaching. Some of them had traveled 110 miles from Pisidian Antioch, hoping that they might eventually be able to catch up to Paul, who had run away from the city and take them out. They were profoundly dedicated, but utterly wrongheaded. They get to the city. They start persuading the people. Paul is not a god. In fact, I'll tell you who Paul is, really. Paul is the guy who sowed division in Iconium. Paul was the guy who, in Lystra, is now speaking blasphemy against the living God. As the crowd hears their accusations, they turn against Paul. They drag him out of the city where they stone him until they're convinced that he must be dead. Commentator Ajith Fernando of Sri Lanka has Christian friends who have been tortured and persecuted in various ways for being Christians. And here's what he says that they have told him about their experience. He says, those who had this happen to them have all told me that the emotional pain of humiliation and the anger that welled up within them over the unjust way they were being treated were more difficult to endure 
than any physical pain or discomfort. Like Paul, these colleagues had been model citizens. This is not the romantic death we think of when we hear the term martyr. It is sheer humiliation, which can cause great shame and anger. That's what Paul's just gone through. He's gone through something awful. He has been utterly humiliated. He has been left for dead and stoned. How would you respond? Here's how Paul responds. Verses 20 and 21. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. Dot, dot, dot. Paul did not quit. He did not quit when they had tried to kill him for sharing the gospel. He did not quit when he was utterly humiliated. He got back up. He kept going. He went on to the next city, Derby, and there he got right back to fulfilling the mission God had given to him. When he gets to Derby, he goes around preaching the gospel and making disciples. You just can't stop this guy. And that brings us to lesson number four. When tribulations approach, we must still continue our gospel mission. When tribulations approach, we must still continue our gospel mission. Even if you have suffered for Jesus, even if you are suffering for Jesus, you must keep going. Sure, you might need to rest for a bit, but you can't quit. Your mission stands. And that's why you must continue to share the gospel and make disciples, even if you have already suffered dearly for doing this very thing. Our God-given mission is a mission to a world that is in need. We can't forget about those who have yet to hear the gospel. Nor can we forget about those who have heard and who need to hold on to the gospel in the midst of tribulation. And here again, Paul sets an example for us to imitate. Paul knew he wasn't the only one who was experiencing tribulation. All these new Christians whom Paul had made on this journey were now living in cities where people were hostile to their faith, where people had a history of persecuting Christians. These new Christians were vulnerable not only to physical danger, but to spiritual danger too. Their faith in Christ was about to be tested in the furnace of affliction. And that's why Paul now goes back to these believers in their cities. He had come to the end of the road in terms of his journey. As you can see there, there's a pretty easy shortcut he could take right from Derby east over to Antioch. He doesn't take the shortcut. He doesn't go the easy way. Instead, Paul chooses to go back to the very cities he has fled so he can help these young believers face the coming tribulation. Verses 21 to 23. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, that's Pisidian Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, With prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Lesson number five. When tribulations approach, we must remember to care for the vulnerable, even when it will cost us. This is the example that Paul sets here as he risks his life to help his new brothers and sisters in Christ. When tribulations come, a Christian can't just think about what they might lose. They must also think about their neighbors. 
and their brothers and sisters in Christ. Because that's what love does when a loved one is going through hard times. Love checks in on someone. Love helps someone in their time of need. So Paul doesn't just go around thinking about what he is risking personally. He's also thinking about how others are doing, what they are risking, what they need. And then he takes steps to help these young believers endure the tribulation that's heading their way. And he does this by strengthening the young disciples, starting in Lystra, where the crowds had recently stoned him, and then in Iconium, where he had recently fled for his life, and then in Pisidian, Pisidian Antioch, where city leaders had driven him out in a wave of intense persecution. And yet Paul went back to these cities to care for these be believers at great personal risk to himself. He loved his brothers and sisters too much to ignore them in their time of need. And in this way, he points us back to Christ, who, as we all have heard, laid down his life to save our lives. We can pull out another lesson here as we look at how Paul counsels these believers here in verse 22. It's lesson number six. When tribulations approach, we must prepare the weak for what lies ahead. We can't let people be blindsided by persecution, or they won't have the perspective or the tools that they need to respond to it in a Christ-like way. Now, let's be honest. Most people want to hear, don't want to hear about persecution that's coming their way. It's sort of a real downer to bring that up in conversation with someone. But it's also not loving to sugarcoat things for someone and to leave them unprepared for a significant challenge that lies ahead of them. It is loving to strengthen others to prepare them for the future that they will soon face. And that's what Paul does here. He tells these believers two things. First, he says, tribulations are going to come our way before we enter the gates of Christ's kingdom. And second, he says, when these tribulations come to us, we must hold on to Christ. We must continue in the faith. So we endure to the end. We need to learn to trust in Christ and follow Christ now so we are prepared to follow Christ in the future. And it will likely become even harder to do so. Because the Bible tells us in the last days, Christians will be persecuted. And we need to be prepared for that. Likewise, we need to prepare each other for that. Especially prepare those who are young in the faith and therefore more vulnerable. But notice how Paul actually prepares these believers. He doesn't point to the scariness of the persecution. That's not his focus. He points them to the object of their faith, Jesus, the one that they need to hold on to. And he points them then to their unshakable hope as Christians, which is their coming life in the kingdom of God. He doesn't just tell them tribulations are coming. He also tells them the kingdom is coming. Jesus is coming to bring the kingdom in its fullness. And if we die in Christ before he comes and does that, then Jesus will be there to welcome us as Christians into the gates of heaven. So as you try to encourage people and strengthen people and prepare them for what lies ahead, don't just tell them that they should expect to be persecuted for Christ. Tell them also that this persecution will never be able to take away their hope in Christ. Tell them that the kingdom will come, and so will the king. But until that happens, many tribulations must first come our way. There's another lesson we'd extract here from verse 23 by looking at Paul's actions. Lesson number seven. When tribulations approach... We must ensure that others are there to look after those whom we ourselves cannot look after. Paul could only do so much to strengthen these believers. He had to go. But before he left, he wanted to make sure that there would be people in their church who would be watching over them and caring for them as this tribulation hit. So he appoints elders for them in each of the churches. 
When we get to Acts chapter 20, we'll dig deeper into what elders are and what they do. But at a basic level, level, an elder is a shepherd who takes care of the sheep. Paul needed people like these, caretakers, shepherds, to care for these sheep that he was going to be leaving behind. Because that's the way of Christ. In the, in the church of Jesus Christ, we leave no one out when we leave no one behind. We look after one another. And if we can't look after someone ourselves, we make sure that someone else is there to look after them. Now let's take a look at the remaining verses, verse 24. And they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time as the disciples. Paul and Barnabas now complete their final leg of the journey, which was traveling down from Pisidia, Antioch, down to the island of Cyprus, and then over to Antioch in Syria. Once they get back home, to Syrian Antioch, they do two things of note. First, they tell their brothers and sisters in Christ how God had been so good to them and to so many others on this journey. They don't gather people together and throw a pity party for themselves to get everybody else's sympathy. They throw a party to celebrate God's abundant grace, how God had saved so many people, even large numbers of Gentiles, on this wonderful missionary journey. This is an eighth lesson for us. When tribulations approach, we must still point others to God's goodness and rejoice even then in his grace. God is always working for the good of his people, even as his people are suffering. And one way we worship God as Christians is by naming God's goodness to us and then responding to it with thanksgiving and with worship. Paul and Barnabas, think about it, they had a lot of stories they could tell. When they get everybody together, the stories they told weren't about how stupid the people of Lystra were. They weren't stories about how wicked the Jewish leaders were. They told stories about how good God had been, how God had done amazing and wonderful things both for them and through them on this missionary journey. Luke says that when everyone had gotten together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Throughout their journey, Paul and Barnabas had kept their focus on Christ and not on themselves. Now that it's done, they're doing the same thing. Look to Christ. Let me tell you about Christ. Let me tell you about his goodness. Let me tell you about his mercy. And they're doing this, even though they know that this very same God had just let them suffer one trauma after another. Who we decide to praise, how we decide to speak and respond to our situation, that's a choice. And as Christians, we must seek to respond in a way that is God-centered and God-glorifying. After they do this, they do one more important thing of note. They stay in Antioch for a while to rest and recuperate. Instead of going right back out and strengthening these vulnerable believers again, they were able to entrust these believers to God and to the elders who were taking care of them. And because of this, they were able to focus on what Jesus has, was calling them to do in that moment, which was to recuperate in Antioch. Considering the tribulation that they had just gone through, considering the fact that Paul was stoned nearly death, to death, they'd gone on this many hundred mile journey, they needed some rest. And by faith in Christ, they were able to rest. They were able to let go because they were able to trust that God was in control and that God is always going to look after his people. This is one of the blessings of rest that 
uh, undergird why Jesus and God want us to rest. When we rest, we remind ourselves that we are not the Savior, that we are the ones in need of a Savior, that we are not God, but God is God. And this brings us to our ninth and final lesson. When tribulations approach, we must recognize our limits and entrust God's work to him. This is part of what it looks like to work for the Lord by faith. We do whatever the Lord calls us to do, even when he calls us to rest. And there are countless other things that we could be doing and countless other people who still have needs. When God says you're done, don't argue with him. Trust that God knows your limits and that God knows what he is doing. Remember that even in trying times like these, God is able to be with his people 24 hours a day. God is caring for his people. God is providing for his people. Sometimes God might work through you to provide for someone. Sometimes he might work through someone else to provide for them. And sometimes he might provide for that person directly. But regardless, we must remember, he is the chief shepherd. And he never forgets a sheep. He never needs to rest. He never fails. He never gives up. He is the one who is sending the gospel to the nations. And his work in no way depends on our work. And yet, by his grace, Jesus invites us to work alongside him. He invites us to bring the gospel to people who desperately need good news. He invites us to protect the vulnerable as he protects them. And to strengthen those who are worn down. With history. May God help us trust him, serve him, and serve others, even while he is leading us through the valley of the shadow of death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we entrust